God's Existence, Truth or Fiction, The Answer Revealed, written by author Gary R. Lindbergh, is a scientific study about the proof of God's existence. Lindbergh examines scientific theories about the origin of life and the Bible's creation story. His approach is different, as he suggests that both science and the Bible say the same thing. Lindbergh offers a powerful theory for readers to contemplate while presenting a unique conclusion. God's Existence, Truth or Fiction, The Answer Revealed is now available at your favorite online bookstore. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to my discussion about my recent book, God's Existence, Truth or Fiction, The Answer Revealed. And as I've mentioned before, uh, I take the reader on a journey with me as I discover evidence about the God's existence. In this case, I'd like to compare it to uh, taking a train trip as we travel from, for example, San Francisco to New York and stop at stations along the way. At each station, we examine more evidence about whether or not God exists. And as we, uh, be, since we've already begun our journey, we're now at the seventh st station and we're ready to examine the evidence here. The chapter or uh, station here is called Physics and Theology. Uh, while reading some books, I discovered a significant book called God, Creation, and Contemporary uh, Physics. And you can see this book uh, in your local bookstore. Uh, it's written by Mark uh, William Worthing and he uh, examines both physics and theology and looks at each one and how they offer valuable insights into the three subjects areas that he has in his title, which of course are God, creation, and physics. Uh, and he talks about the exchange of dialogue between the, the, uh, uh, the two sides of the, of the equation, the God and physics. He favors an exchange uh, of views between those two groups of adherent, adherents. So, uh, but uh, Worthing starts off by making uh, two assumptions or stating two, two assumptions. The first assumption he says is that science can legitimately uh, address questions related at least indirectly to the existence and role of God in our world. Uh, the second uh, assumption is that while th theology cannot critique specific science and technical aspects of physics, it is free to analyze the relevance of the results of physics for theology, as well as to critique the validity, consistency, and significance of those conclusions that are clearly metaphysical and th or the theological in nature. So while he favors a dialogue between uh, theology with respect to nature and what he calls a, a more humbled attitude by a scientist. He, he uh, says that, that it's, he favors this theology between Christianity and um, physics, but by a more quote, uh, uh, in, by scientists instead of their usual quote, what he claims know-it-all attitude. And in discussing these segments, uh, arguments about God's existence, uh, Worthing focuses on three major arguments, although he acknowledges that some people talk about five types of arguments, but he focuses on three, and those three that he talks about are called ontological, cosmo cosmological, and teleological arguments. The ontological argument is, uh, according to Worthing, uh, it contends that uh, God exists necessarily. So in other words, this means that he exists because it's necessary for him to exist. Well, that sounds a little bit more like a wish to me than, than scientific evidence of his existence, but uh, that's one of the major arguments that, that is offered. Uh, the second cosmological argument originated as far back in time as Aristotle and that Thomas Aquinas later expanded. It comes about because people have observed that everything in the world, either including matter or movement, uh, exists, even though it appears to exist by uncertainty or by chance. 
that is actually caused to exist. And that cause is God. Now, the third theological argument is based on the natural observable world. This argument, Worthing points out, is the fifth way that Thomas Aquinas uh, claims that proves God's existence. To explain this argument more clearly, Worthing uh, cites an 18th century theologian, uh, William Paley, in his 1802 work, Natural Theology. And in this, he poses the concept that there is, quote, so much beauty, order, harmony, and precision in the natural world that it must have been designed by a higher being who continues to govern the world, unquote. In other words, uh, the th theological argument says that the world has so much beauty, order, and harmony, and precision that it must have been created by a higher being. Uh, who still even controls uh, the world to this day. So Worthing uh, goes on to address some pertinent issues that we might consider as well. First, he talks about whether or not God could create uh, out of nothing what is the concept called creatio el nihilo. Uh, pardon my Latin, but that's uh, what it means is that it's created out of nothing. And Worthing says that natural science and uh, physical, uh, uh, natural science deals with matter, physical laws, and the relationships that exist between and within physical realities of the universe. But most of all, natural science deals with explanations. And I emphasize that, but most of all, natural science deals with explanations. Uh, that, that statement uh, that deals with, that uh, science deals with natural, ex, uh, with explanations indicates to me that science really can deal with a situation without an apparent explanation. In other words, if one could say that if it can, if they cannot explain it, it does not exist. That may be a little bit of a stretch, but anyway. Uh, it also de demonstrates that science is a discipline in which existence of anything must be physical and must have a cause. Uh, the quote means that science cannot comprehend any notion that a superior being can exist uh, or can create out of nothing, something out of nothing. As a result, they dismiss that uh, theory creatio uh, ex inilio as a concept of theology instead of one of science. Now, moving on, the second issue that uh, Worthing tries to discuss is the existence of God in terms of space and time. Now, he poses a question. How free could the creator have been in choosing the initial conditions of the universe? Well, if God is the creator, it seems to me he must have total uh, freedom to create what to create as it happened, when it happened, and how it happened. Doesn't that make sense? Uh, the fact that he had millions of options to consider or choose from does not obviate or prevent uh, his ability and the power to make the choices that he needed to make and that he chose to make. If he had the power to create such a huge universe, then I su suggest that he had the power to sort through the many basic options and to select the ones he desired for the earth and for every other planet in every solar system in the universe. Now, just as he was not necessarily compelled to choose identical options for the earth that he chose for life forms on other planets in various solar systems, uh, he, he was free to choose whatever kind of option for any planet he wanted. Now, for example, he could have chosen uh, different mixtures of gases on other planets instead of the oxygen-rich environment that we enjoy here on Earth. But since uh, humans have not yet visited other planets, uh, let alone other solar systems, how can we dispute whether or not this uh, position may be true or even false? Now, it is foolish to question the extent of God's 
freedom because he had the power to do whatever he wanted to do. It's also foolish to pretend that he couldn't do it. Uh, we humans cannot impose limitations on God. After all, he's the creator, not we, the created, are not the creators. So in our ignorance or and short-sightedness, we cannot uh, offer any direct or concrete evidence to prove uh, the contrary allegation. We know that men of learning have done this before. For example, when they claimed the earth was flat. I mean, we, it's happened throughout uh, the centuries. So uh, this is nothing new for to create, to uh, invent uh, concepts that are, are later prove false. Now, if God is the creator, then he had, and he has, uh, the power to create whatever he wanted or wants from nothing to any other way. So Worthing discusses uh, quantum physics, which I think is an area that's beyond the scope of my book. And I so I leave that for another book. So I uh, offer these concepts and, and, and ideas to you as uh, for you to consider and, and think about if you have any questions you want to give me or offer to me, uh, you're welcome to write me at GaryLindberg85 at gmail.com. That's Gary Gary Lindberg 85 at gmail.com. And if you also uh, would like to go to my webpage, uh, GaryRLindberg.com, GaryRLindberg.com, uh, you can check out the, the books, but you could, there's a contact page there where you can offer me your suggestions, ideas, even if you have uh, comments in opposition to what I have to say, you're welcome to offer them. And if you want me to reply to you, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, again, that's uh, GaryRLindberg.com for the website. Uh, or more directly, GaryLindberg85 at gmail.com. So I leave this with you for now, and I hope that you have a a great day, and uh, I hope that you keep safe and, and healthy. Until next time, we'll look forward to seeing you then. Bye-bye. God's Existence, Truth or Fiction, The Answer Revealed, written by author Gary R. Lindberg, is a scientific study about the proof of God's existence. Lindberg examines scientific theories about the origin of life and the Bible's creation story. His approach is different as he suggests that both science and the Bible say the same thing. Lindbergh offers a powerful theory for readers to contemplate while presenting a unique conclusion. God's Existence, Truth or Fiction, The Answer Revealed is now available at your favorite online bookstore. The vegetable grows and the lion roars. Read about the work and life of Peace Corps volunteer Gary R. Lindbergh in the early days of this program in Ivory Coast, Africa. Learn about his adventures and travels to places like Nigeria, Mali, and more. Join his excitement as he witnessed the lions, leopards, and other wild animals as they roamed across the plains of East Africa. It's all there for your enjoyment. The Vegetable Grove and the Lion Roars. Available now on Amazon. Get your copy today. God's Existence, Truth or Fiction, The Answer Revealed, written by author Gary R. Lindbergh, is a scientific study about the proof of God's existence. Lindbergh examines scientific theories about the origin of life and the Bible's creation story. 
His approach is different, as he suggests that both science and the Bible say the same thing. Lindberg offers a powerful theory for readers to contemplate while presenting a unique conclusion. God's Existence, Truth or Fiction, The Answer Revealed is now available at your favorite online bookstore. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to our discussion about my recent book, God's Existence, Truth or Fiction, The Answer Revealed. Uh, I'm really uh, uh, happy to talk to you today, and uh, I am. Uh, we're now approaching on our uh, train trip to uh, to the eighth station, and a very interesting chapter uh, that's titled uh, "A New Theory Presented." Uh, it seems to me that this is a powerful concept, and uh, I think that you might find it as exciting as I do. Uh, we have studied. Uh, and we've discussed scientific theories about creation, the origin of life, and, and of course, creation according to the Bible. Well, the aim of this exploration and examination is to determine whether or not God exists. And so I want to now turn to start answering that question. Can we verify or prove that God exists? You may be surprised at how much real proof exists to answer that question. Now, so let us present a new powerful theory about creation, all life, and God's existence. First, it's necessary to point out that all human, animal, and plant life must be either directed or non-directed. In other words, I'm saying uh, all life must be directed or non-directed. There are no other alternatives. Life cannot be half directed and a half non-directed or a quarter directed and three quarters non-directed or any other proportion that we might identify. Now, if life is half directed or some other proportion, then we have to identify and account for who directs that half or portion. If some life form or superior being directs uh, half or part of life, then it opens the discussion to explain why the life form doesn't uh, direct all life. Isn't that make? Isn't that true? Uh, thus, all uh, thus, and I'm saying that life is all one way or all the other. In other words, all directed or all non-directed. If human, animal, and plant life is non-directed, then there can be no limitations on what kind of growth can develop. For example, humans can be born with three arms or four legs or fewer arms or fewer legs or some other deviant physical differences. And they can grow extra eyes, arms, legs, or other anomalies over a lifetime. So uh, that's that's kind of strange, isn't it? Uh, as an exa another example, animals can similarly be born with three legs instead of four, or two heads instead of one, as well as any other deviant from uh, deviation from the norm. Like humans, animals can develop mutations and changes in their bodies over a lifespan. Now, as a third example. If you plant certain a certain vegetable, for example, corn, you could have potatoes grow up instead, or some other variant of corn or other plants. That would there would be no limitation on what plant life is produced, or how it is changed. Humans, animals, and plant life would be able to deviate in numerous ways, at birth, and over time. In short, there would be no law of science that requires any order of life. DNA would be non-existent. Hmm, that's pretty strange. Uh, however, as it is now, humans are typically born with one head, two eyes, two arms, and two legs, consistently. Now, that consistency means the birth and growth of a baby is limited or constricted in accordance 
to certain guidelines. Now, generally speaking, these guidelines are strictly adhered to. Now, granted, there are some babies born with deformities or other abnormalities. Uh, however, those babies are exceptions to the general guidelines to which most babies adhere. Likewise, animals follow similar guidelines. Plants also follow strict guidelines. So if you plant corn, you will typically harvest this type of corn that you planted. That kind of limitation in human, animal, and plant life means, I suggest, that such life is directed. The consistency in life, because of the limitations, reinforces that life is directed. Oh, now earlier, when we looked at plant life, we found many levels of organization. Those levels of organization uh, included kingdom, phylum, class, cl order, family, genus, and species, going from the most general uh, wide category down to the more most limited specific category. Now, if life is uh, non-directed, then every part of human, animal, and plant life must vary or deviate in, numer in innumerable directions and amounts. There can be no limitations, no limits on the or order, such as we saw in bot botany or zo zoology by the many levels of organization. Now, anything can happen uh, because no limits exist. So if all life is non-directed, then all life growth must deviate uh, as well by accident or uh, by random. One accident occurs after another without limit of any type. One random event occurs after another, after another, without any time limit. This means that all human, animal, and plant life develop by accident or by random without any rhyme or reason or at any level of, or, and it can be at any level of organization since we supposedly have seven levels of organization of plant and animal life. Uh, but those, the, actually those uh, uh, levels of organizations cannot exist because there's no directing force. They don't, they don't happen on, by accident. In contrast, when, if life is directed, then such extreme amount of organization as we uh, have seen is rational. And it clearly demonstrates an order caused by a directing force or intelligent life form that we may logically call God. We also previously noted how organized the human body is. One might dismiss this as, by asserting that DNA creates such uh, consistency in all life forms. However, this assertion fails to explain the cause of DNA in the first place. What's the cause of DNA? You have to answer that. Yeah, here, we suggest that God created DNA and all those levels of organization. So uh, science is built on the concept of cause and effect. In science, we know that there is a cause for everything. Everything has a cause. Are we gonna claim that science demonstrates that there is a cause for everything except for the creation of our solar system or accept for the creation of our universe? If there is a cause for everything, then there must be a cause for everything, including the galaxy and the universe. There can be no, there can be no exceptions. We cannot pick and choose where truth exists. We cannot deny it in other areas that might be inconvenient for us to believe. We discussed how huge our galaxy and our universe are. Billions and billions of stars. Well, can we presume to assert that such a vast array of billions of stars 
simply organize themselves in, in an arbitrary way and form constellations and, and such by accident. Uh, they created themselves by accident into galaxies and the universe. If all life is directed, then an intelligent force created humans, animals, and all science, laws of science, galaxies, and the entire universe. It, it seems to me that's pretty strong. How can we interpret and explain the differences between the Bible and science? Who created the Bible? Who created science? When I was about 12 or 13, I was thinking about these things and I thought carefully and I realized that God created the Bible by inspiring humans to write it and organize it. But he also created science. Since he created the universe in the first place, wouldn't he create science by, uh, at the same time? Uh, well, so I concluded that the Bible and science must say the same thing. God cannot contradict himself. So the two must say the same thing, even though there are different, the, he's, people say it in different languages and, and descriptions. The real difference between the Bible and science is basically humankind's misinterpretation of the Bible, misinterpretation of science, and or misinterpretation of both. I, as as a sidelight, we uh, the, the Bible is 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 not a, a really a document of uh, a historical document, although it offers a lot of history, and but it's more geared toward behavior. And that's what the Ten Commandments started out being, uh, offering us behavior, how to behave. Uh, but as scientists or archaeologists and other uh, no knowledgeable people have investigated history, they have noted that the more and more the, they've dug up pl places and things, uh, artifacts to prove that the, some of the, the descriptions in the Bible are proving to be true. There's another example of how the Bible and science say the same thing. So as a young man, I used to uh, quote the Bible or read the Bible that people quoted, uh, which claimed that a thousand years was merely a blink of the eye for God. Well, now more recent translations of the Bible phrase the same point, but somewhat differently, but they carry a similar meaning. The point is the creator of the universe cannot, cannot be confined to our human thinking process or sense of time, such as 24 hours of, uh, in a day. If the Bible says that God created the whole earth in six days and then rested, that does not mean that God created in accordance with humankind's perception of six 24 hour periods of time. It does not mean that. It means that God acted in accordance with six days from God's perspective and outlook. God has a different perspective of time than humans have. We have to understand that. We have to recognize that. In contrast, science says the creation and development of the earth and humankind took millions and millions of years. Well, if God is as, as, as immense a being as we know him to be, one day to God is more like millions of years in the human perspective. So thus God acts in terms of God days, not human days. We, uh, wouldn't we think that's pretty obvious? It seems to me that's pretty clear. God acts in terms of God days, not in terms of human days. If we look at it from his perspective, we would probably find uh, and not that we can't are capable of doing it, but uh, we would probably find that there are six distinct periods of time when God performed his creation in the manner that the Bible describes. Six days God were, uh, did, per, created and uh, during six God days instead of six human days. And then the seventh period or day 
he rested. Now, Jesus said, told us, seek ye the truth, and it will set you free. Seek ye the truth, and it will set you free. Do you think that God is afraid of science? Of course not. God is not afraid of science. God is not afraid of the truth. So why are we so afraid? Why are we so afraid that uh, we might say that, that uh, the truth, that can't be the truth? Uh, when we think about uh, this, we, we need to realize that God operates on his schedule and his timetable, not ours. And our attempt to uh, reduce him, the, the all-powerful creator of the universe, down to a, a human day is laughable. And we need to realize that uh, God is the creator, not us. So in summary, uh, this theory that we present in, says that all life, including an, human, animal, and plant life, is either directed or non-directed in its gr creation, growth, and death. If all life is non-directed, then its creation and growth must be by accident or at random, which then permits existence and growth in all different, unlimited directions and ways. If life is directed, then a higher intelligent being causes life and growth on a consistent basis. All sciences are highly organized, such as the levels of organization we talked about in botany and zoology. Uh, and because it's so organized and precise, uh, it provides in itself scientific evidence of the existence of God. Since the universe is so huge and beyond the comprehension of humankind, I, I suggest that the creator must be greater in size, scope, and power than we humans. When we think about this concept, it strikes me as a powerful theory that helps us to better understand creation, all life forms, and God himself. Uh, this is a, a very uh, strong theory, and if you have any uh, questions or comments you want to offer, uh, you can write me at GaryLindberg85 at gmail.com. That's GaryLindberg85 at gmail.com. Or if you prefer to go to my website, uh, GaryRLindberg.com. That's GaryRLindberg.com. Uh, you can find a contact page and you can uh, get in touch with me, offer me your questions, comments, or, or disagreements. Uh, I'm happy to hear whatever you want to tell me. And uh, if you want me to respond, I'll be happy to respond to you. Uh, but you can go there to offer my, me your, your thoughts. Uh, that's GaryRLindberg.com for the website and, and go on the contact page and, and offer me your ideas. Or you can go to uh, my direct email, Gary, Gary Lindbergh 85 at uh, gmail.com. Gary Lindbergh 85 at gmail.com. I'd be more than happy to listen to you and hear what, you, uh, what your thoughts are. So with that, I want to wish you a good day. Uh, hope you stay healthy and safe. God's Existence, Truth or Fiction, The Answer Revealed, written by author Gary R. Lindbergh, is a scientific study about the proof of God's existence. Lindbergh examines scientific theories about the origin of life and the Bible's creation story. His approach is different, as he suggests that both science and the Bible say the same thing. Lindbergh offers a powerful theory for readers to contemplate while presenting a unique conclusion. God's Existence, Truth or Fiction, The Answer Revealed is now available at your favorite online bookstore. The vegetable grows and the lion roars. Read about the work and life of Peace Corps volunteer Gary R. Lindbergh in the early days of this program in Ivory Coast, Africa. Learn about his adventures and travels to places like Nigeria, Mali, and more. Join his excitement as he witnessed the lions, leopards, and other wild animals as they roamed across the plains of East Africa. 
It's all there for your enjoyment. The Vegetable Grove and The Lion Roars. Available now on Amazon. Get your copy today. 